Hello and welcome to Buildings of Tomorrow. My name is John Lester and today I'm joined by Elisa Ronka, the Head of Smart Office in the region Europe for Sieben Smart Infrastructure. And today we are talking about flexibility in the workspace of the future. Elisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. So the future workplace, you know, the, the modern office, uh, when we talk about flexibility, what do we refer to uh, in this aspect? So I think flexibility is really one of these really interesting topics because there are so many different ways we can look at flexibility. Um, so first of all, the spaces need to be flexible. We know that there will be much more remote working or project-based working, and that means that you need to maybe contract or expand your spaces um, from a, let's say, volume perspective uh, due to the nature of business. On the other hand, you might have to, let's say, reconfigure your spaces based on the different types of work that people are doing or the preferences that the human sensor is telling you, you know, what works, what doesn't work um, with the individuals. So it, it has to do with the, let's say, the physical uh, flexibility. But what's really juicy is then that what you actually do in terms of culture, the kind of how do you drive agility in the workplace? So it's one thing reconfiguring the spaces from a volume or a fit out perspective continuously. But how do you actually drive up, for example, space utilization, if that's a topic for you, uh, or drive down? That could also be a, another another topic. And, and that's where it becomes really, really juicy how do you kind of uh, make sure that you drive behavior the right way yeah right so it's not just providing a space which people can pick and choose how they use it and maybe saying hello project uh, for the next three months you sit here or, or whatever it might be it's also trying to drive the the required behavior so you can achieve those goals because you can't just tell people to work flexibly and expect them to to change everything completely how how would we go about something like that so that's that's really interesting because I think um, usually everyone goes to analytics and uh, analytics are important. That gives you the snapshot, the status quo of where do we stand at the moment? How do people use the spaces? How much are they used? How do they engage with the spaces? But I always like to challenge customers with this question that then what? You know, what do you do with that information? You get a nice dashboard, for example. Um, but that doesn't change any of the pain points that you might have. So how do you actually reach that next level? Uh, for example, utilization being a great example. How, how do you make sure that you actually drive utilization up? And that then requires to have means for the people to be able to find the spaces better so they can be more agile, so they don't waste time trying to find that vacant meeting room or trying to find a good work spot that is uh, along their lines of preference. So really having this kind of end user interface that works together with the analytics and make sure that the KPIs are being driven up, uh, that's that's crucial. And it's you know easier said than done in a way. It's one thing to dump technology and expect everything to work fantastically afterwards, but it's actually a change management process for, for people. And, and that's where you need to take that. That's a human factor um, very much into consideration. Yeah, because that's, a, a, again, a very different step because analytics within, uh, let's call it operation, or when we're focusing on energy efficiency or something, it's the same concept. You know, the analytics is that first step. It gives you the insight and the snapshot, but you have to turn that into actions to, to use it effectively. It's just a little more difficult to turn it into actions when we're talking about people and the way they spend their time and how they go about their daily work. So that change management is a really interesting part. And how, you know, we mentioned technology there and how you can't just throw technology at it, but I assume that you must need some kind of technology to help uh, create this interaction, to create this connection. For sure. So first of all, I think from an infrastructure perspective, because, you know, building life cycles are long, you need to make sure that you have, let's say, flexible technology or operating technology in the building that allows you to do, for example, the physical fit outs or, or whatever is needed. Uh, that already isn't always um, uh, a given, uh, especially in older buildings. So I think for, you know, any new, newer buildings that needs to uh, become a standard. Um, otherwise, you know, you will run into trouble <laughs> later on in the journey. But then once that let's say the infrastructure piece is in place then it's about the digital means so really um, having the analytics in place and feeding the data from different data sources those could be part of the building operating technology already or then additional sensors in order to gather that meaningful data that you need and then you need an end user interface Currently, as the world stands, it's usually via a mobile app. So mm -hmm. something that the users always carry with them that they're able to then, let's say, get that transparency of the data real time for them so they can do whatever they need to do in the spaces better. Usually it's about finding, finding people, finding spaces that yeah. creates the agility and reduces the friction. 
And and that's the that's one of the important parts, isn't it? Because that last word that you used, friction, uh, is also something we have to be a little bit careful about, right? Because we know that uh, whether it's a, a, a normal program we use on our laptop or an app that we find in our smartphone, it has to give value without adding friction to our daily life, or we just don't like getting involved. And there are so many friction points in the workday that we just have gotten so used to that we don't even kind of criticize it and try to necessarily reduce. You know, we are we are used to scrambling to find, uh, for example, a vacant space and everyone is frustrated about it. And it's a huge dip in productivity because it's time lost, but it's also really a dissatisfaction. All the time. All the time. I call it office gymnastics because you try to, you know, look up and above, you know, these meeting room windows or is there someone there? Can I take that room? And even though, you know, it's good to practice a bit of gymnastics each day, right? But, uh, uh, you know, in essence, there are more efficient ways to actually find what you need. Um, and, and these friction points, we just need to get rid of. That's absolute waste that we just yeah. need to get rid of to actually drive drive value. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to put you uh, on, on the spot just to finish off this topic. Um, could you give me a, a bit of a use case, a bit of an example where where this kind of thing has been achieved? You know, uh, you know, uh, an anonymous idea of, of how a company has taken the requirements and through this interaction, we'd be able to achieve their ultimate goals. Yeah. So we have some big, big global corporations that have kind of looked at it from this holistic point of view. So they first deployed the technology that's needed to get the analytics in place on how people use the spaces. And then they've deployed an application, a mobile app on top um, to really drive this behavior. We've seen uh, statistics like 25% productivity increase wow. of employees and uh, increase in space utilization of 20 to 30% globally on their global portfolio. So these are impressive statistics wow. that you can really achieve. And if you, if you really start quantifying that, into monetary figures, especially the productivity part, it becomes uh, extremely lucrative. I think that, as, exactly as you mentioned, that's uh, the capability for us to quantify because it's not something that we can collect as a data point um, is is a challenge. But at the same time, you know, when you're talking about these kind of numbers, even if there's a little bit of uh, give and take within that, it's a huge impact that that. I think is benefiting both areas. And I think that's one of the points that that um, that I hear a lot is that, okay, from a business perspective, that's great to to have a, a rise in productivity, but that also has a, a, a personal uh, positive reaction because for me, if I if I go to work and I feel like I get a lot done, I walk out of there with a smile on my face. You know, it, it, that sense of achievement is a huge aspect to to this additional value. And that's so true. And I think productivity is sometimes uh, very much misunderstood as a term because it's somehow seen as, you know, like uh, employees being the machine that, you know, do the profit for the organization. Of course, that's one dimension to it. But actually, based on research, employees want to be productive. Productivity is really a very satisfying feeling. Uh, and it's it's really part of the, let's say, employee satisfaction and personal well-being as well. As you said, this feeling of accomplishment. Um, and we should not look at it just from a traditional, um, you know, uh, negative viewpoint, because I think if we start looking at it from this individual positive uh, factor of viewpoint, we actually end up driving it in the, the right way. If we aim at the satisfaction and, and feeling of accomplishment of individuals, the business results will come as well. Yeah, and this is there's a lot of quotes from from you know many business leaders when people talk about culture, eating strategy for breakfast, and all these kinds of things. You know, if we focus on that culture and you focus on the personal impact, then you have the opportunity to drag all of these other uh, more business focused KPIs with it. Exactly, exactly. So people first, uh, also when it comes to workplace technology, also when it comes to infrastructure flexibility, think about people first and the use cases that you want to drive with these individuals. Uh, and then you end up getting reaping the benefits uh, in, the, in the long run. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. And thank you all for joining us here on Buildings of Tomorrow. Please feel free to share, like, uh, comment on this episode. Subscribe to us on all your favorite podcast channels. You can also find some of these videos on YouTube and join us again soon. Thank you.